Hey, folks. It's like we're live. Right on time, almost. 1.30. Let's give it a minute. Wait for people to, to head on down. Um, okay, so uh, we're getting nigh on the end of the term here. What's up, Akib? Uh, welcome to the party. Um, so, you know, af I think after this we have three classes. So this is the fourth la last class. Um, so we're kind of we're we're we're, we're kind of in the end game here, and uh, so <clears throat> we're gonna have to be a little bit careful about what what we're able to cover. Okay, so uh, today I'm gonna finish up. We're done. We're done. Like, you know, mucking around with the Romer model, but but I will talk about, like in terms of solving it. Like, basically, we solved it. Um, I will talk about uh, how to interpret it, kind of the efficiency of the Romer model in the sense of like, is the amount of research that we find efficient? Because remember, we we constructed the whole product market and we thought about what are firms' incentives to create new products. Okay. Um, uh, given like the value and the profit stream that they expect, um, and also given the, the wages that they have to pay to their researchers, um, and we found some s this SR, which was uh, this here. Okay, I got that get that green screen lined up here. I strive for perfection. Okay, um, yeah. So that SR over here uh, we found, which is that that's the rate that's the fraction of, of labor that you're putting into to research. Okay, so um, that's that's equal to object. And so then the question is, is that efficient? Like, you know, we could have chosen anything in some sense, and this this was what came out. Um, and we want to think about well, what if what if what is efficiency in the setting? What does that mean? Uh, what is optimality? And uh, and then it does this meet that standard? Okay, so it turns out it's not going to be quite efficient because there's some spillovers and externalities flying around here that we need to worry about. Um, and so, yeah, okay, let me just make again perfection here, near perfection. Okay, uh, okay, there we are. Um, yeah, so so we need to we need to think about that. All right, um, we could do it. We can more or less do it graphically. Okay, I'm going to throw down some equations, and then we're going to plot them and like think about marginal benefit and marginal cost, and then that'll that'll kind of help us clarify things. Okay, so um, let's do that. Uh, I added a few things to the slides that basically just deriving SR. You can check it out in Jones. It's a similar thing at the end of the the chapter. He goes through the derivation there. Um, it's a little involved. Uh, I didn't do, uh, you know, I I tried to to include as many steps as I could, but you know. With slides, you can't write a million equations. So, uh, but I think I got all the sort of important waypoints. Okay, um, yeah. So, so let's let's think about uh, let's think about Romer. All right, let's think about uh, the Romer model again uh, and efficiency. Okay. Um, yeah. So, but I, I, in terms of the rest, I was talking about the rest of the term. Uh, in terms of the rest of the term, we're gonna we're gonna move beyond the Roman model. I'll talk we'll, we'll talk about some extensions and variations on the Roman model. We're not gonna solve them. I'll just sort of give you the, the idea behind them. And I think that's enough. Um, we'll do some practice problems maybe today if we have time. Uh, and then after that, you know, maybe that'll take this week and a little bit more or like a little bit less than this week. Um, and then after that, maybe gonna pivot into sort of thinking about. Um, Growth more generous. This is you know it's a growth model. This is a way to think about how fast the economy grows over time from research and technological growth. Um, so then I'll kind of circle back and think about things more empirically. Say so like, okay, what if we're looking at countries and we want to figure out what kind of policies promote growth and stuff like that? Uh, that's difficult. You know, it's sort of a correlation causation thing that always pops up in this domain. So we're going to talk about that and how you can like be clever and careful about that maybe extract some information from the data, okay? So, um, but for now we're gonna do a bit of theory, a bit more theory, and then, and then we can move on from there, okay? So let's think about efficiency now here. Um, so 
we're going to think about efficiency through through marginal benefit, marginal cost sort of uh, way. Okay, so you got um, private marginal benefit. Okay, I'm going to write MB. Uh, we can't see your writing. That's true. Okay, there we go. Thank you, uh, Lauren. I believe. Um, okay, so private PMB we're going to say is the the private marginal benefit. Okay, and then like uh, you know PMC you can you can figure that that out. Uh, that's a private marginal cost. Okay, and then we're going to have SMB and uh, SMC. Okay, uh, which are you know like social. Marginal benefit and that last quadrant, social and marginal cost. Okay, so um, we're gonna think about those and, and basically social optimum is where you said these two things equal. Okay, you said social marginal benefit equals social marginal cost, and then the, the equilibrium outcome basically sets these two equal. Okay, it's like it's not like it, that was I mean that that's how we solve for the equilibrium, basically. Okay, but like by design, just like that's that's what happens in an equilibrium. Okay, that the firms, you know, the researchers keep investing until their their benefit from doing so equals the cost. Okay, so generally these things can be different. Okay, and that's what creates some different between difference between the equilibrium, the private outcome, the equilibrium outcome, and this the optimal social outcome. Okay, so that's that's pretty much it. And it turns out that that remember that free entry condition. As I called it, the free entry condition, which basically said, you know, you want you want to, you know, if you're if you're a firm, okay, and like you invest, you, you like hire like one researcher, and they have a probability of coming up with a new idea, which we call theta bar, and then the value, uh, which we call v, okay, um, of generating that new idea is like the present value, okay, that's. Uh, private marginal benefit. Okay, I did that backwards. That's uh, private marginal benefit, and then W is private marginal cost. So we're saying like uh, that that benefit, the expected benefit, the pre present value terms should be equal to how much you're paying that researcher. And if this was bigger, then we'd have more research than we already did. If this was smaller, then we'd have less research. And so like in an equil equilibrium, these two should be equal. Okay. So that's so that's the sort of like the free entry condition is literally saying private marginal benefit equals private marginal cost, and that's where we derive everything. Okay. So then, um, all right. So then, uh, you know, I'm just going to go through sort of like the steps that we did quickly um, of plugging in stuff. So then that v uh, that v. Okay. So I we could, in the notes I think I did I call it I probably just called it v or vi, but it doesn't matter because they're all the same. So it's going to be pi over uh we we eventually derived it like this so it's, it's the stream of profits divided by some discount rate so to get from that stream of profits to the present value you sort of divide by this discount rate which is the interest rate minus n okay so why exactly this is is complicated but like it's a, it's some kind of discount rate is, is the important part okay um and then now remember also we want to have handy so this is this is free entry. Okay, uh, let's also have handy um, the income shares. That's basically all we need. Okay, where is income going? Okay, and remember we found those. All right, so we found that uh, a times pi was equal to alpha squared times y, and we found our k was alpha times one minus alpha. Did I get that backwards? I probably did. Yeah, sorry. It's a times pi, that's one minus alpha, one minus alpha, okay. So let's just, just start over. So remember that the three income sources are profits, capital, rental, and labor. Okay, so this one is alpha times one minus alpha, a fraction of y. This one is an alpha squared fraction of y, and then this one is a one minus alpha fraction of y. Okay, so it's profit, capital, labor. Okay, and these all add to one. Alpha minus alpha squared plus alpha squared plus one minus alpha. 
that all adds up to one. So income got to go somewhere and it got to come from output. So that's, that's how it works. Okay. So essentially these three sum to Y. Okay. Now uh, we can use that. Okay. Because this implicitly tells us uh, what W is going to be. This implicitly tells us what pi is going to be. Okay. So let's just, let's just keep this as W for now. Okay. So we plugged in for the, the profit, how value is a function of profit. Okay, and then the next step is plugging in for these these shares. Okay, so we know that for pi, okay, so we're gonna have this term outside here, and then pi is gonna be uh, alpha times one minus alpha y over a. Okay, so to just move that a over alpha times one minus alpha times y over a. So that's pi. And this is the, the extra terms here that we're carrying around. And then W is uh, one minus alpha times uh, Y over L. Okay, so move that L over, you get W equals one minus alpha times Y over L. Okay, so the cool thing here is that some stuff cancels and we can make this nicer. We can make it friendly or slightly. Okay, so uh, in particular, the Y's cancel. This one minus alpha cancel. So let's get rid of those and make our lives slightly easier. Okay. So alpha, theta bar, over i minus n. So I got a one over a floating around. That's going to be mildly annoying. Okay. And then here we just have one over l. Okay. So now we're, it's simpler, but it's not clear that it's better. Okay. But um, we're going to get there. All right. Uh, let's see what's the best way to do this. So, okay, we need to invoke another thing that we know that's sort of like on the books, okay, which is the uh, production function, so the research production function, okay, so these are like headings here. Uh, the research production function, right, that's important. That says that the rate of generation of new ideas is equal to theta bar times r, okay, so it's like a linear technology, the productivity is theta bar and it, it doesn't have any sort of cumulative stuff. It's just you make new technology from labor and the existing level of A doesn't really matter. Okay. Um, all right. And so then if you turn this into a growth rate equation, GA or G, what we usually call G, is A dot over A times theta R. R. Okay. So here you can see it's divided by A. Um, you know, it, a doesn't enter into the current rate of change but if you think about it in growth rates then like to get the same growth rate it, it's more and more difficult as technology goes up because like your production it happens sort of like linearly but then to get exponential growth you need to keep you know generating more and more ideas and so you that actually gets harder in proportional terms okay um okay but then the good thing here is that for this equation which says that ga is equal to theta r over a you can solve for one over a. So if you divide, you get GA over theta bar times R is equal to one over a. Okay, so that's that's what we're gonna use for one over a. Okay, and then the other thing we know is that uh, I'm gonna say, so the total population, sometimes I write the total population as P. I guess I can do that here too, why not? Because it is growing. P is population is equal to uh, production labor plus research labor. So, you know, someone's got to, everyone's got to do something. They're either labor, production labor, or uh, research labor. Okay. So, and that's going to be useful here, plugging in here. Okay. So let's do, let's plug in that stuff we know here. Okay. So then we get alpha theta bar over R minus N. One over A is now GA over theta bar R. And then this is one over, so L is P minus R. So this is like whatever population isn't going to research goes to production labor. And so this is P minus R. Okay, so, so now you can see we, we basically have things in terms of R. Okay, we want to think about this as a choice of, of how do you allocate labor between production and research. Okay. Um, okay, now... In fact, all right. Uh, the last thing we're going to do, and this is this is just not it's not too crazy, is is we want to think about things in proportional terms. So instead of thinking about r, we really want to think about like r over p, the fraction of people doing research. So like sr is going to be r over p. 
okay um so so here you know you can see like if you just you know every term here has some r or p term so if you just divide both sides by um p actually i guess if you multiply both sides by p then um actually wait so hold on there was some canceling that i didn't know so, so first of all these theta bars are going to cancel so we're going to get alpha g a over r minus n okay so so you multiply both sides by p so then you get p over r which is 1 over sr and then here you get p over p minus r which is actually 1 over 1 minus sr okay so then now everything is proportional right and so we can write it like this 1 over sr okay because that's just like r divided by p and then 1 over 1 minus sr Okay, so now we made everything proportional. Okay, so this is like is it capital R or lowercase? No one knows. Let's do it capital. Um, <clears throat> okay, so now we've really expressed, remember this is private marginal benefit uh, and uh, private marginal cost. Okay, we've expressed these in terms of um, the research share, okay, which is like the most important choice uh, in this economy. All right, and they are kind of going in opposing directions. Okay, so if you think about, um, let me use the let me use the ruler, like some axes here. Boom, boom. Okay, so we think about these axes like here. We're gonna have R, sorry, SR. SR. Okay, and then that's gonna can't be greater than one. You can't put more than 100% of your people to research, okay? Uh, so if you go from one, this is zero, okay? This is one, and then, um, yeah, so we're gonna plot these here, okay? We're gonna plot these these PMB and PMC, okay? So uh, the cost, okay, I guess, um, when SR is zero, that's gonna be equal to one, and as SR goes to one, that goes to infinity, okay? So that's starting here, here at one, this is not a good graph, but it's, it's tough. Um, that's going to infinity. Okay, pretend it was actually smoother. Um, and it goes to infinity when, you know, sort of asymptotes at this dotted line at one. And then uh, this guy, the so that's the PMC, prime marginal cost. This guy uh, at one, you know, it's gonna be like some number. So alpha GA over R minus N. Okay, let's say that's greater than one. Uh, from here, and then it's going to decrease. And now it's not constrained by s equals one, so it'll just blow right through that, which is fine. Okay, so it's going to like do something like this. All right. Um, okay, and then you, this curve goes up, this curve goes down. They have to have a unique intersection point. That's always good. Uh, we have a unique prediction for SR, which is right here. Let's call that SR star. Okay, so that's like our equilibrium. That's where PMC equals PMB. Okay, um, all right, so that, that's our equilibrium concept in terms of like solving it. Okay, that's what we, you know, if you solve this algebraically, like we did last time, you get exactly a number that corresponds to that intersection. Okay, now um, if we think about um, the social component, okay, so that was private. Now we think about efficiency and the social component so we're basically looking for SMC and uh, SMB SMB and SMC okay um, if we think about that social component okay um, it's actually it's a little bit complicated all right uh, but I'm gonna give you kind of a heuristic to, to work by okay so let me, let me see if this is the right way to do it yep so I'm gonna give you a heuristic now, now you can think you can basically think about it like this this the, the social marginal benefit it's gotta somehow be related to the sort of marginal product of technology. You know, like you need to know how does more technology or better technology make output better. If it doesn't make it better, then there's no social benefit, right? So that should be kind of proportional there. And then uh, social marginal cost, it's gonna look like something like del Y del L and it, because this is the cost of doing research. So when you when you do more research, you do less production. So when R goes up, L goes down. 
So then that cost is going to be that marginal product, right? If L goes down, you're going to lose this little bit of, of production, okay? So these, these things here should kind of correspond, right? There's a little bit of a nuance. And this one is, is basically right. This one, because we have capital, now remember our production function in the aggregate ended up looking the same as the old Cobb Douglas, all right? Um, so that's going to make things our lives easier. Okay. Now, if you think about, okay, you have the, uh, the marginal product of a goes up basically. That's what happens when you, when you successfully do research. Okay. Um, and what happens then? Okay. We're, so we know, right. We, we've seen this actually almost exactly. We know that right away, uh, output goes up because of the direct effect of a, we also know that because uh, there's more production, that means there's more investment because it's proportional, and that means the capital is going to go up even in proportion. Or, well, it's going to go up. It, it's not going to go up necessarily in proportion to AL, but it's going to go up um, and regain that proportionality to AL. Okay, so um, so there's the initial effect and then the induced effect in capital. We saw that question. Okay, so. Um, it's not going to, it's not going to exactly be del Y del A because that's only the initial effect. It's, there's going to be a, a compounding effect. It turns out that's going to just be come out. as like a proportionality thing. It's going to be like 1.2 times the initial effect here, or what we saw like two, I think in, in the last time. Okay. So, um, so this is, this is going to be right up to like some constant, which is fine. Okay. Um, so that's the basic, that's the basic idea. We, we, we work with this production function, get these things and then, and then look what happens. Okay. So um, I think that's it. Yeah. So so we can we can compute that stuff really easily. So del y, del a, right? So you know, remember whenever you take derivative of these kinds of functions, you just take the coefficient that's on it and then divide by it one time. That's what taking a derivative of these power law type functions looks like. Okay. So you're going to get, you know, one minus alpha from this coefficient here, and then whatever you started with. Uh, divided by a, okay? That's just how you take a derivative of, of, a, of a power function like this, okay? It's also equal to like k to the alpha, a to the minus alpha, l to the one minus alpha, blah, 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 but this is easier, okay? And then the same thing for del y del l, del l to y del l is you get one minus alpha y over l. Same, same logic, okay? Um, that's good, right? So that's now we know, um, and uh, yeah, so we can plug we can plug that in basically, and then go from there. So the other thing is, this is this is the benefit of, of getting additional a. Okay, there's one extra thing we need to tag on there, which is theta bar, because that's saying okay, we put in some research labor, the probability of getting a success is theta bar, and then this the benefit of getting success. So then the, the total should be theta bar times this marginal product technology. Okay. And then, then we're good. All right. So <clears throat> we should have something like this. Okay. Which is means these two are equal. Okay. Um, all right. So let's plug in. Uh, so we're going to get, and you, you can see that this looks similar to what we got up top. So this is theta bar times one minus alpha uh, y over a. And then one minus alpha y over l. Okay. Um, just checking my notes here to make sure I'm not going off the rails. Ah, forgot about this counting. I forgot about one thing, which, which is important. Um, we need to know. We need to throw another thing on here. Uh, throw it here. We also need to to realize that this is like a present value. If you improve technology today, that lasts forever in this model. So this picks up the change like per period per year, and this turns it into like a present value by dividing by the discount rate. It's just like pi over r minus n. This is that marginal product over r minus n. Okay, so then we're gonna have this over r minus n. Okay, so now it really does look a lot like uh, what we had up top of uh, basically something like this. Okay. Um, all right. So now stuff cancels. Okay, one minus alpha cancels. Y cancels. All right. So then we have theta bar over R minus N, one over A, and one over L. Once once these one minus alpha terms here and the Y 
are gone. Okay, still looks pretty similar. Okay, now, um, what else can we do? Well, we have this one over a just like before. We can use this one over a trick here to get that to look like a some function of r. Okay, so that's ga over theta bar. R, so, um. So that one over a is going to be ga over theta bar r. Now that's still true here in the equilibrium because uh, it's just a function of the research production function. Okay, or it's a, it's, a, it's an implication of the research production function, which is still you know the law of the land here. Okay, um, so we can keep on using that. Uh, okay, and then finally okay, these thetas cancel, so we get ga over r minus n, we get one over r. This is one over p minus r. Anything that's not research is production labor. Okay, and then finally, we do, we multiply by p to get one over sr and one over one minus sr to turn it into like a proportional notion. Okay, so this is really the took a couple lines to get there, but this is our social version of that. So this is um, up to like some constants. All right. Okay. So what do we see? So one thing is that SMC is the same as PMC. That's good. Uh, PMB. Let's we can we can almost we almost have enough screen real estate to do it. Alpha. G A over R minus N. The only difference between any, all these equations is there's no alpha here. Okay, there's no alpha down there. All right, and that's basically, or or another way to think about it is that when alpha is equal to one, they are the same because then the this here is one, and so they're exactly the same. So so uh, alpha equals one implies PMB equals PMC. That's interesting. Um, now remember that the price that we found, this is a while ago, the, those little firms, those intermediates, the price they charge is uh, R over alpha. Their marginal cost R divided by alpha. If alpha equals one, they, alpha equals one, they charge marginal cost. They are effectively charging competitive prices, okay? And when the prices get competitive, the pre uh, that that was this is wrong. So this should be SMB. Okay, SMB. When the prices get competitive, those private and social incentives line up for the for the benefit side. Okay, um, and then either way, whatever happens, these PMC and the SMC are always the same because like the the labor side of stuff is sort of there's no distortions there. It's pretty efficient. Okay, so. Um, essentially, so, so we see that when alpha equals one, things line up and that happens to correspond to the case where there's competitive pricing. So essentially it's monopoly. Okay. When there's a monopoly, that means P and B doesn't, doesn't quite get equal to SMB. Okay. Um, because they're kind of siphoning off some of those social benefits into, into the social like the consumer surplus, if you want to call it, into profits, and so they're 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 blunting the incentive for uh, new research. Okay, so yeah, um, but also it should be noted when alpha equals one, technology doesn't matter. So it's efficient when alpha equals one, but also it doesn't matter when alpha equals one. So it's like, it's kind of a, I don't know if you'd call that a catch 22, but it's a little bit of a weird situation. Um, so uh, yeah, I mean, it's pretty hard to get efficiency lined up with these monopolists because they're, they're interfering with price signals. Okay. So, um, but the cost side is fine. Okay. So then what is, what does that mean um, in terms of this graph? Okay. So this thing, uh, Remember, alpha is less than one. That's that's the the this thing here has to be less than one. So this, um, whatever the case may be, this social marginal benefit is greater than the private 
marginal benefit because this one is greater than alpha. Okay, so social marginal benefit greater than private marginal benefit. That means that, uh, okay, so here, so that's going to intercept instead of alpha g a over r minus n, it's going to be g a over r minus n. Okay, so it's going to be like up here, okay, and then it'll just be kind of like proportionate. Okay, these should be, these should have a constant proportion. They don't in the graph, but they should. That's SMB. Okay, so what does that mean? Well, you know, this curve is higher. The intersection is farther along. That means that what we'll call SR hat, oh no, is greater than SR star. The, the social, the socially optimal outcome is greater than the the equilibrium outcome. There's, or in another way, what I was saying is there's an underinvestment in research in equilibrium relative to the social optimum. Okay. Um, all right. So that's interesting. Okay. And, um, and it, in this case, it basically comes from monopoly, right? Not the board game, the market structure or outcome monopoly. All right. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I guess it also comes from the fact that if technology isn't important at all, then neither social nor private incentives should be positive. Okay. So, um, okay. So that's one thing. So now, and th now the one thing though, is that the fact that it's just monopoly and not other stuff is, is specific to this model and the way we set it up for the reasons that I'm going to go through right now. Okay. So, um, let's call these like distortions. So monopoly is like a distortion slash spillovers. Okay. Things that induce inefficiency or inefficiencies or externalities. Okay. Um, so what is it going to be? So we, we, we've already discussed one. One is, is monopolies. Okay. Monopoly. Um, we discussed that check. Uh, number two. All right, so I guess there's really only two things, but there, there's there's sort of two components to number two, which is research spillovers, okay? Um, and the two components correspond to phi and eta, those coefficients on a research production function of old. Okay, so remember the the uh, the old Jones research production function. So that looked like Okay, so the, the way that, um, oh, I like this, this is better. The way that Jones writes it is this. He uses theta as like some coefficient, constant, different from theta bar. We'll see why. Uh, a to the phi, and then r to the eta. That's how Jones writes it. That's basically how I write it. Sometimes I use gamma here, but let's, let's go with theta. Um, now, in the model that we should, uh, that we're using this Roman model implicitly kind of, where we had this is our our production function for ideas, a dot equals theta bar times r, okay, or like theta times r, okay. So so let's say that um, what it, what is a dot equals theta times r? Kind of how does that fit in here? Well, that that just means that theta equals sorry phi equals zero and eta equals one. Okay, this if this is zero and this is one, we get that production function that we've been using. Okay. So this is like, the, this is our position in the Jones taxonomy is phi equals zero and uh, eta equals one. Okay. Cool. So um, that means that this actually corresponds to the setting where there's like no research spillovers. Okay. Because I'll, I'll, I'll talk about this in, in more detail in a second, but like basically Phi equals zero means there's no proportionality. So like if I do research, it doesn't make your research any easier or harder. It's no interaction. Similarly, with R having a, a coefficient of one, an exponent of one, so R to the eight, eight where eight equals one, uh, the marginal is a, if I do research, okay, your like your marginal effect here doesn't change either. Okay. So that's, that's another thing. Um, yeah. So that, yeah. So, so the, because it's like linear, you know, there's no, if I, it's not like if I do more then it gets more easy or more difficult in the future for you. Okay. So there's no spillovers in terms of like, um, I'm 
you know, stealing your ideas or we're doing the same thing or, you know, we're not coordinating. There's nothing like that. Okay. It's just totally separate, separable and linear. Okay. Um, okay. So how can we think about that a, a little bit more carefully? Okay. So remember the way that I'll get on here, the way that Jones writes it and that we're writing it is, is actually, this is where we get to the difference between theta and theta bar. He actually writes it as theta bar R. Okay, because essentially you're saying, okay, there's some theta bar out there, which might be like a function of what other people are doing, but, but I'm just an individual and all I think about is what I'm doing, given what everyone else is doing. Kind of a Nash equilibrium concept here. Okay, so, so according to this equation, I mean, essentially if you invert it, then it means that theta bar is eta over r. So it's like the marginal product of r, or like the average product of r, really. It's the average product of r. Okay. Um, given what everyone else is doing. Okay, and if, if we use this general Jones formulation, then that's equal to theta times, well, it's theta a to the phi r to the a to minus one. Okay, so just take this thing, add another minus one from this, the dividing by r. Okay, now what does that mean? Uh, well, we can do the same thing we usually do, which is like, well, this is this is naturally a, a numerator kind of thing, because eta eta should be less than one. The decreasing returns here it should be like a concave function of, of r, because we don't want increasing returns in r. That doesn't make sense. Um, so we can put that in the denominator and make it a one minus eta. Okay. So what this says is. Um, Because, okay, so this is the cumulative nature of technology. If phi is positive, if people have done more stuff in the past, it makes my life easier in some sense. I'm, I'm using that as input. I'm using like calculus as input to do stuff, okay? Uh, conversely, um, if R is less than one, so this is like some concave term here, then other people doing research makes my life harder because they're, they're like coming up with all good ideas and it's hard for me to, do something new, you know? It's like the more people there are on Twitter, the harder it is to come up with like a joke that no one's made before, right? There's this sort of like, what what matters is like the best. And so you gotta be the best. Um, that effectively looks like decreasing, decreasing returns to scale, okay? Um, now, in our case, remember we're in theta equals zero, eight equals one. And it just so happens, well, okay, theta equals zero, that disappears. Eight equals one, that also disappears. So in our case, we have that theta bar equals theta, but that need not always be the case. Okay, it just, we kind of cooked it up like that. That's why in our case, we basically have no research spillovers. Okay, um, the, they don't really show up in any meaningful way. It's all the monopoly stuff, okay? But we could, if we wanted to, change things up and we'd have spillovers, okay? So, um, so that's another, that, those are that those are like, important efficiency considerations. Okay, so um, now in terms of the growth rate, remember GA, I feel like I, I need to, I wanna make sure we're all clear on this. Let's think about the growth rate again too, just so we're, so we're clear. That's, um, that's, that's gonna be, you know, theta a to the phi minus one, r to the eta. Okay, and then again, it's natural to put these two up top and then because phi is less than one to make this sort of a, a downward force in the denominator. Okay, so here you see, you know, like more research means more growth, more technology, more past technology means it's harder to get proportional growth. Okay, so here, like past technology in levels and just the derivative sense, you build on it, you need it as an input. So it's it's necessary. Here it's more like past technology. It's it's harder to increase proportionally because you've already done so much so far. Okay, um, yeah. So okay, so here uh, we can see in in our case. All right, so in in Romer, like this is like specializing this equation. In Romer, this was one. This is zero. Okay, so we get G A is theta r over a, okay, right? 
and that means that uh, for this to be constant, it should be that like gr is equal to ga, okay, and then gr is just the population growth, okay. So so in our specific setting, we got that ga was equal to to n, okay. Um, but in general, of course, we would have we find that ga should be equal to like eta times n over one minus phi, okay. So that's that's where you get these, you know, if this is growing at rate n and this whole thing is growing at eta n, that should be equal to ga times one minus phi, which is what this comes from. Okay. Um, so, so, so our special case is kind of a, it's a, it's the simplest case, but it also eliminates some of, some of the potentially interesting spillovers coming from uh, that, that kind of action. Okay. Um, all right, and then yeah, I guess when you step into those other areas, then it theta bar gets a little bit funky, okay, and it kind of changes over time. Uh, so in some sense, our, our this is the safest place to be for us, okay. So I'm not going to go through that because I think um, I don't know, it's just, it gets too complicated, and I don't think it's worth uh, belaboring at this point, okay. So. Uh, but essentially, you know, just, I think it is important to think about these these types of uh, spillovers. Okay, monopoly kind of are the monopolists really thinking about the best, or not the best, but are they thinking about the, the true impact on social on consumer surplus or just their own profits, which can be different? Uh, and then the research spillovers, kind of um, essentially, like you know, how how important do you when you like I said, if you if you improve technology. Or like I build on past technology. That means that people in the past that made that technology are benefiting me. They're not really getting compensated. Okay, that's that's a spillover. When you when you do something that benefits someone else, but you don't get compensated, it's an uninternalized spillover. Um, and then the same thing with with that's phi and with with ADA, then it's more like you know there's a negative spillover, a negative externality, uh, which is also uninternalized, which is we might duplicate, we might be competing for research or funds or something like that. That's that's that negative externality, but neither of those are, are internalized. Okay, so yeah, but those that's the real important stuff there. Okay, now that's pretty much. I mean, that's kind of it for for regular old rummer. Okay, um, I realize I I have this tendency to like lean back, and then the mic doesn't work as well, so I'll try and stay up front. Um, so the that's regular old rummer. Okay. We can juice it up a little bit. We can add stuff, important stuff, not just like bells and whistles, but like really important stuff that changes the interpretation. Okay. And the most important thing is really thinking about how firms compete. Okay. Um, and this, and this is something that Jones covers explicitly in the, in the, the book, the, the treatment in the book is a little wild. I, it, it, yeah, it just, there's a lot going on. And so we're not going to go through that. I'm going to give you the conceptual overview. And, and I think that's perfectly sufficient. Okay. Um, but because the idea is an old one. Um, so this, this, this fella by the name of Joseph, probably Joseph Schumpeter. Okay. Maybe you've heard of him. Uh, he had this whole notion of creative destruction. Okay. Um, so that's what that's the this is the other model that Jones does this so called Schumpeterian model. Okay, and this sort of reimagines a little bit how competition works. Okay, if you think about it with the the Romer model. Okay, um, so think about the Romer model uh, in terms of pop up back here competition what does competition mean in the setting um it's not not like price competition because these, these firms are all monopolists okay it's more like market share competition they're jockeying per position that you know they want to they want to be the one that has the biggest market share in in the smartphone market you know whether it's iphone uh whether it's apple google or maybe microsoft but not really um you know they want to, yeah. Um, they want to they want to dominate this market, and they, they they try and improve their products and their technology, convince people that their products are better, and expand the market share. 
Okay, so that's well, that's one way. There's also like lock in. You know, you can you, know, you have to have like cloud sync and all of these services that tie together. That the, a lot of that's to, to lock in your consumers once once you get them. But part of it is just like you want to make a better product. Okay, and if you make a better product, maybe other things being equal, you should get a few more customers. Okay, so that's that's what they're they're investing in technology to try and steal, effectively steal. I don't want to say steal, but acquire customers from other firms. Okay, and so, but there's kind of two things going on. One is like. Maybe they're acquiring them from other firms, or maybe they're 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 acquiring new customers entirely. Okay, you know, maybe this is less true, like kind of for you guys, but it's like you know at some point there weren't smartphones, and they made smartphones, and they were good, and people bought them, and so you had this this extensive margin expansion of increasing the total market share for the entire industry, and then once that kind of got saturated, then it became just trying to 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 you know steal them from from other. Uh, firms okay so that's the kind of competition that's creative destruction because it's creating new and better technology but it's also destroying the market share of the other firms okay so it's kind of like this disruption if you want to call it i guess disruption is really the new term of art for that kind of stuff okay so um now if you think about it here like uh this this thing the 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 competition really in the in that sense is is what this decreasing marginal benefit curve looks like either one um so here the competition was just like yeah you know, like the better the sort of like the better technology gets because there's like decreasing returns like if someone else improves technology and you improve it then their your marginal improvement is, is worth less if they do more okay it's, it's just decreasing returns purely on the production side um the humanitarian is is also going to have a, a competitive component that that shows up here okay in this kind of decreasing marginal benefit but it's going to be more like if i'm doing a ton of research okay and you're a firm out there operating i'm going to come after you right i'm going to eventually succeed and try and replace you and if you know that you're it's going to kind of decrease your time horizon you're it's going to increase your discount rate you're going to have a shorter time window for which you think about like profits okay um and that's going to decrease your value okay so that's going to like push this not going to push it down like uniformly it's going to decrease it's going to push the slope down the more research firms are doing the more creative instruction there is the more you're getting taken out as a firm and so then this this slope is going to be downwards okay so that's more downwards than it already is okay so that's what we're going to see um okay so that that's that's creative destruction it's, it's kind of like disruption okay now um Okay, so how can we think about this? So what I just said was more more firms doing research. Okay, it means more creative destruction. I'm gonna call that tau. That's creative destruction. Oops, tau is creative destruction. Okay, um, and then so like tau you know, r goes up, tau goes up, and then uh, that means that like v, your value is gonna go down. So, so the way I'm going to write this is like V is going to be, you know, whatever your profits are, which we'll get to, divided by, you know, some interest rate discount kind of thing plus tau. Okay. This is actually what it would look like if you solved it. I'm just going to assert it. Basically, like tau ends up looking like a discount rate. You know, if, you, if you got an, inc if you know tomorrow, you know, Apple is going to, you know, come up with a better product and, and just deploy it on their phones uh you're probably out of luck um and so if the, if you if you think about that then your your value is going to be lower your present value is going to be lower okay um so like the more yeah more competition you have out there that's going to push your value down and it's going to look like a, a higher discount rate okay so this is sometimes people say you know private firms are too short term looking the short termism they're too focused on their next quarterly profits okay that's kind of what this is going to look like okay this tau is going to make them look really short sighted so that's the equilibrium outcome. Maybe that's the case. Okay, it's just, it, it, not to say that it's efficient. It's not efficient. Okay, they should they should really just be using R. But you know the world is imperfect. Okay, so um, that's how that's how creative destruction is going to affect value in this case. All right. Um, okay. So then, and then we're gonna you know we can think about you know what what is the actual value of creative destruction. Well, it's going to be some 
research, you know, is going to produce new ideas and hence create destruction. And let's just let's just use the same thing. The productivity of research is like theta bar. So put in some research. It's got a certain probability of succeeding. That's your rate of created destruction. Okay, very simple linear game. All right. Um, and then we still have, you know, like, let's just say there's a, let's just say there's one, not one person, but like one unit, 100% of people and they're either production or research. Okay. So you usually have P here. Let's just say there's one unit of, of population out there and L and R are percentages or fractions. Okay. That's fine. That's good enough for our purposes. All right. Okay. Um, well, we're kind of, we're kind of almost there. All right. So we kind of know. Here's creative destruction. Here's how it affects value by making firms short-sighted. Okay, uh, we kind of need to know what profits are at some point, though, right? That's sort of important. Okay, um, so let's do that. Uh, but to know what profits are, we need to understand technology a little better. Okay, so the um, and specifically how technological improvement works in this kind of model, right? So in this model, so before we, we'd have A, right? The number of products going up. We're not gonna have that anymore, okay? In fact, we're gonna have A equals one forever. There's only one unit product. So when we, when we do those integrals, we're gonna go from zero to one, right? So, but the products are getting better, right? So it's not like we're making more products, we're just making them better or making them cheaper or something like that, okay? So we're saying, um, and, and this, this is called the quality ladder model. Quality ladder model. Okay. And so basically, uh, you have, you know, some, that's not a thing. Uh, let's use the, let's use the ruler. Uh, you have some, this is going to be the quality ladder. We'll see. And we've got like little rungs on here. They're not exactly straight, but yeah, good enough. Okay, and so essentially you've got like, you know, the initial, we don't want that anymore. Okay, you got the initial quality, we'll just call like one. Okay, then you got like the next generation. Someone did an innovation, they make it lambda. Okay, and then someone comes along again and, and keeps improving it, and they improve it proportionally. So now it's like lambda squared. Okay, so like lambda is, or, yep, so it's like lambda is greater than one. Okay. Um, yeah, so they, they keep improving this, lambda cube, lambda the fourth, and so on. That's how things get better. Okay, so there's a fixed number of products, but they keep getting better and better and better. All right. Now, what does this mean for profits? Well, think about Bertrand competition, where you have two firms, okay, they have a certain productivity these cues like quality or productivity or whatever and uh they have they might be different though okay we kind of know from this setting that if you have two firms in bertrand competition uh with the same productivity they're gonna compete with each other until they uh make no profits they, they price at marginal cost they make no profits okay that's one thing now if you have one firm that's better though they can make profits, right? If, if you have a, you know, firm A, or like firm, let's say you're like firm number four, okay? They're like the state of the art. They have the highest productivity. Their next best competitor is firm number three. So if they set a price equal to firm number three's marginal cost, they're still making profits because they have a higher, or sorry, they set up, Yeah, they, I mean, they, they set, they'll, they'll set a price. Yeah, they have a lower marginal cost. They set a price equal to firm number three's marginal cost. Firm number three says, I can't compete with that. If I were to price at that point, I'd make zero profits. If I were to price lower, I'd make negative profits. So I'm out. So effectively, firm number four, the leader, they got a little bit of a margin. That difference between their productivity and the next one, that's like their profit. Okay. And what's that, what that's going to look like is like, Turns out it's going to look like like lambda minus one over lambda. Okay, so, uh, so remember lambda is greater than one. So if lambda is one, these firms are all compressed and similar in terms of their productivity, and they make zero profit. As lambda gets larger, lambda goes to infinity. You're infinitely better than your competitors. This thing is going to converge to one actually. So it's going to be one over. This is 
this is one minus one over lambda. So if lambda is one, it's zero. If lambda goes to infinity, it converges to one. Okay. All right. And, so, and actually there's, there's, there's going to be a factor of Y here too. So it's like this thing times Y. Okay. Um, just it's like a proportionality. So so actually, you can think about this as uh, the share about the share about, but the profits of the firm are some fraction. Let me write this a little better. It's going to be the same thing. It's going to be better. There's some fraction of output. So it's it's just like those those uh, income shares that we did before. Okay. So and that fraction of output is just how big are these steps they're taking and hence how good is their competition okay um and then you can you can show pretty easily that you know wl that labor share is going to be whatever's left over okay so it's going to be like one over lambda times y okay so that's that's cool um that's going to be useful all right so so we can basically like kind of intuitively you have these products improving over time the bigger the improvements the more, more monopoly power the firms have and the more profits they make. If firms make more profits, workers have to make less wages because there's a fixed amount. You're dividing the income equally or like um, between the two. Um, and so that's it. Now I'm ignoring capital. I'm just shutting down capital. There's no capital here anymore. We don't need it. Okay. We're just producing with labor. Okay. So then that's actually like from just from that. Okay. Like, I, like I didn't prove anything. I sort of just asserted it and gave you intuition, but it turns out that this is actually, if you work out the model, this is actually how it works out. So, um, okay. So now we can, we can basically, uh, think about that old question of private marginal benefit equaling private marginal cost. Okay. This is going to be like our equal equilibrium concept. Okay. Um, What's that going to be? Well, that's going to be, we can go through the same steps. All right. So first step is the benefit of doing a bit of research is you might succeed with probability theta bar. And if you succeed, you'll get some value V. Okay. And the cost is W. So that's the same as we had before. Okay. Now we know, now things start to differ slightly. Okay. So now V you remember is pi divided by this new discount rate with that extra tau factor. There's, you could have a minus sign, it doesn't really matter, okay? Um, pi over r plus tau equals w, okay? So that's all good, all right? I'm gonna go like super vertical here, okay? So and then it's just, okay, now we have pi and w, we know what those are, so this is, uh, minus one over lambda times y over r plus tau, and that's equal to right. So w is like one over lambda times y over l. If you solve for w here, you get one over lambda times pi over l. Okay, so my lambdas are getting funky. Okay, so um, cool. Now things cancel as before. The lambdas are going to cancel a bit. This is one of lambda. The y's are going to cancel a bit, all right? So then we get theta bar is left. Lambda minus one up top is left. R plus tau, still there. And then over here we have one over L, just like before. All right, so it's like pretty simple. Instead of like alpha stuff, we have lambda stuff. So, so uh, otherwise, and then we have this tau factor, okay? So, um, all right, now we're like really close because we know everything. We know that tau is equal to theta bar times r. We know that L is equal to one minus r. We can plug those in here. Okay, so let's do that. So theta bar and minus one over r plus theta bar times capital R. Okay, and then this is one over one minus r. All right, so now we can draw our graph. Let's do that. I'll draw it over here. Okay, so still got one as our upper bound for R. This is R, remember? This is zero. Uh, 
Okay, so what is, maybe if I draw it like this, it'll be easier. Kind of. Okay, that wasn't so bad. Um, so this is, just drawing these curves so that private marginal cost, which is actually going to be equal to social marginal cost. Uh, that, that marginal cost curve looks the same. It's one over one minus R. It goes to infinity as R goes to one. It starts at one. Okay, and it's strictly increasing. Now, right, so this is, over PNB and PNC. Okay. Um, now that private marginal benefit curve. So that's going to start up here, say, at um, when r equals zero, this this will be, you know, theta bar lambda minus one over r, lowercase r. It's going to start here. And then we're going to do something like this. All right. And this is, this is actually, yeah, it is PNB. Okay. So that's going to be decreasing, but for different reasons. Okay, now it's decreasing because of this spillover where I do creative destruction, I kick you out of the market, that lowers your discount rate and in, in expectation, and and that that's that's a thing. Okay, so you still get that unique crossing of one decreasing line and one increasing line. You still get that unique equilibrium R star. Okay, you could solve for that. It's a thing. It's it's linear here, but but I won't do that. So you get some equilibrium crossing point. Okay. Now, now here's where the big inefficiency come in, comes in, though. All right, so, so if you think about, this is the private side, okay? If you think about the public side, the social side, I guess. Okay, so this, this one, we're not going to, like, derive it explicitly because it's a little complicated. But um, essentially, it's going to look like, it's basically going to look like this. So... It's going to say, okay, you put in one additional researcher socially. They have a productivity still, theta bar. That's the probability coming with a new idea. That's still going to be around. This lambda minus one is like how much things improve. If lambda equals one, then like there's no improvement over time from from research, from tech, from new ideas, which is boring. If lambda is greater than one, you get improving productivity from research, from technology. Okay. Um, so that product there is sort of like the the pi the, the 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 current value effect, and then you divide by r to make that a present value effect. Okay. The other side is actually going to be the same. It's going to be one over one minus r. All right. So um, that's what you get. So this is the same right as as social uh, as private marginal cost. Okay. That's the same as private marginal cost, and then this is. Um, it's actually greater than private marginal benefit because it's constant, right? So this one, it starts exactly at the same place, right? But then it, it goes linearly across. So let's use technology here. It goes across, it's constant, okay? That's your social marginal benefit, okay? So you can see, this is an insane example, but like, you know, according to this one, you know, you should have like a ton of research. Uh, let's call this like R hat the optimal level of research. You, have, you should have like a ton of research in here. You only have like some, okay? Um, you know, you, really these should be shifted down a bit less than one, but like you, you, you can still see that there's more, optimally you should do more research than happens in equilibrium. There's an underinvestment in equilibrium because of this R term here, because that R term pushes this down because of creative destruction, okay? So that's pretty much it. You know, there's a, an investment research. Now, there's still some monopoly stuff which I kind of glossed over, which which could sort of affect things. But but this is like the new the new factor is these firms are you know jacking with one another for position, and that creates potential inefficiencies. Okay, um, it creates short sighted firms, which is something we believe we observe. It's hard to define short like who, who's to say what is the proper amount of discounting the proper sightedness uh, in the world, but the general consensus is that there may be some short-sighted firms out there. Okay, so um, yeah, I mean, that's, so that's the Schumpeterian model, okay? Uh, yeah, the, jo the, the don't worry about the book, I would say if you wanna go through it, be my guess, but I don't think it's super enlightening and it gets really technical, so I wouldn't worry about what's in the book chapter too much regarding Schumpeterian. Regarding Romer, you know, I think that's more enlightening and that it's we, we went over it in great detail, so that should be fine. 
Okay. Um, yeah. Okay, so I think what we can do now, we only have about 10 minutes left. All right. Um, let's draw a line there. Uh, so we, we, we can do other stuff. So there's there's a couple things that I'm, I'm thinking maybe we can do. All right. We can't obviously do all of them, but we can entertain them. Um, so there are some, there's some questions in the back of the uh, chapter five. Okay. That I thought were decent. Okay. Um, not chapter five. All right. So, okay, you probably only really have time to do one question. So I'm going to choose wisely. Uh, which question we do? I will attempt to choose wisely. Um, I think really the third question is probably the best. Okay, so this is. Uh, scroll a bit more. Need a new page. Okay, so this is uh, Jones. Chapter five, question three. All right. In case you don't have your book, I'll read it for you. Okay. Uh, all right. So here's what it says. Uh, the future of economic growth from Jones 2002. I guess he had a, he had a paper on this. Uh, recall from figure 4.6 and the discussion surrounding this figure in chapter four that the number of scientists and engineers engaged in R&D has been growing faster than the rate of population growth in the advanced economies of the world. Okay. So our you know, GR okay, uh, is greater than G, uh, what we're calling like, well, GR is greater than N, N is the population growth rate. Okay, so let's just do that. The growth rate of capital R is greater than the population growth rate. What that means is that SR is going up over time. The share of researchers is going up because they're growing the numerator is fast, growing faster than the denominator. Okay, that's all that means. You know, it used to be 0.1, now it's 0.5%. Okay, so it's still pretty low, but it's, it's been going up. All right, so, um, okay, so then well, what does that mean? Uh, can we think about that in terms of this Jones model? Now, this is really, this isn't even really going to be using Romer. It's just going to be using that simple Jones model that we usually uh think about okay so that you know this this kind of model but he this is theta a to the phi you can get a lot of mileage out of this equation actually um okay so then here's what it says it says to make some plausible numbers assume population growth rate is one percent and the growth rate of researchers is three percent per year okay so uh so n is 1% and then GR is 3%. Okay, remember SR is, so it's a P, so this is like growth rate of the population. So that's, SR is, it's not P over, it's, it's R over P. SR is R over P. We know from the rules of growth rate, this means SR is actually growing at 2%, three minus one. Okay, so if that helps, this is an S, not a delta, okay? Um, SR is growing at 2%. Okay, so then, um, okay. Uh, okay, and then assume that GA, growth rate of A of technology, okay, is a constant about 2% per year. Okay. So... What does that portend? Well, there's there's a couple of questions here. Let's work through them. Uh, a. We're running out of time here. Uh, using equation 5.6, calculate an estimate of lambda over one minus phi. Okay, so uh, I assume equation 5.6 is GA is equal to A dot over A, which is, this is in general, okay. Uh, you know, it's going to be theta a to the five minus one out of the eta, which is theta r to the eta over a 
to the one minus phi. Okay. Um, oh. Okay. Um, so it, it seems like Jones is using lambda here. I didn't realize that. I'm going to use eta and, and translate this for you on the fly. Okay. So <clears throat> equation 5.6 is. Let me just double check, but I'm pretty sure that it's the growth rate, the steady state growth rate equation. Um, this is a long chapter. Uh, 5.6, okay. Yeah. So what, uh, what do we know? So, so this is saying GA is constant at 2%. Okay, that's that. That's what that, I mean. That's what you see, and that's what Jones is reasserting. Okay, if GA is constant according to this equation, then this thing should be constant. Okay, so um, if GA is constant, then uh, uh, this thing should be constant. So basically, you know, eta times GR should be equal to one minus phi times GA. Okay. Um, all right. And so uh, what does that mean? Well, that means that, um, so he wants us, yeah. So that means like in particular that eta over one minus phi, okay, is GA over GR. Okay. So you just, just solve this. Okay. You know, th this is the this is the same as saying that GA is GR times eight over one minus phi. Okay, so so he wants us to estimate this. Okay, well that's just equal to GA over GR, which is two percent over three percent. Okay, so that's you know that's two thirds. Okay, All right. So so eight over one minus phi is is two thirds. Okay, and then. Um, that's A. Now B says, so, so A is basically finding, find this. Okay. B, question B, part B. Using this estimate and equation 5.7, calculate an estimate of the long run uh, steady state growth rate for the world economy. So, so remember that, um, This equation, this this is saying that uh, G A is constant, okay. But also remember that G R R is is kind of growing faster than it should. In the long run, R should um, eventually has to grow at something like the population growth rate. You can't have R growing faster than the population forever because that means that SR would grow forever and it'd go above one and it can't go above one. You can't have more researchers than people. Okay. So, so R has to come down to earth eventually for the short run. Yeah, it's fine if it, if it's exceeding that as SR rises, but it has to come down to earth eventually. Okay. So what does that mean? So, so this SU use equation 5.7. So equation 5.7. Okay. Says that GA so, so if, you, if you solve this equation for GA, that says that it's equal to eta over one minus phi times GR. Okay, that's just a restatement of, of these equations here. And um, in steady state, GR should eventually be equal to population growth rate N. So this should be eta over one minus phi times N. Okay, now we just estimated that thing, that ratio that maps from like R stuff and A stuff is two thirds. Okay, and then we also know that uh, N is equal to one percent. That's what was given in the problem. Okay, and so then the long run growth should be two thirds of a percent, which is not great, but that's what that's that's a prediction. Okay, um, so it's a little slower. Okay, so the idea is. We've been actually increasing the research share. Researchers are growing faster than population. So we're getting like artificially fast growth because we're we're putting more and more researchers in even proportionate to population. We can't do that forever because you can't have more researchers than people. And so eventually you need to have it come down to earth. And that means 
that it's going to be proportional that that gr is going to be n conditional having backed this out from the from the previous question then we can find that it's two-thirds of a percent okay now we could do some other stuff we could say oh well what if we were to increase population growth rate by up to two percent then you could get this to like you know almost one and a half percent okay so it means you know, it depends on your assumptions about population but yeah which is going down actually the population growth rate so um but yeah this this is the, the answer there okay uh Okay, C, C is why does your answer differ from the 2% that we usually usually see? And I just, I just said that. Okay, so um, done. Okay, and then D, uh, does the fact that many developing countries are starting to engage in R&D change this calculation? Um, yeah, it does. Uh, so if you think about the total, total world research share is like R USA plus R you know, other, there's gotta be a better, what's a, what's a short term for, you know, I don't know, uh, this are the rest of the world. Okay. W okay. Over, um, L USA plus L W. Okay. So, you know, if, if, uh, if the rest of the world, let's say this is extreme, obviously, let's say the rest of the world was doing zero initially and then it went up, you know, that would, if the rest of the world is doing zero, you get some fairly low total world research share. And if they start doing more, then they're going to push up the world research share. Okay. So as more and more developing countries start uh, developing and industrializing, whatever um, term you want to use, start doing more research. Like we're seeing that with China, this, I guess is the big story now. Um, and some you know, India, some extent Africa. So um, as that happens, that's going to push up the world research share, which could, you know, is going to, is going to keep it so that, um, SR can keep going up for some time, you know, so it's going to extend that period where we can have this sort of, uh, kind of unusually high growth. Okay. Um, for some time, maybe a while even. Okay. So, so that'll certainly be a factor though. Okay. Um, all right. So that's it. I'm like a minute or two over, uh, that's it for now. Um, and then, yeah, so today's Monday. I'll see you all on Wednesday. Um, you know, keep working on those uh, those case studies. Okay, we can talk about that if you want. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll talk about stuff that I'm, you know, kind of stuff that I think would be cool to do or something that I, I'm, uh, I could do it for the US, for instance, as a baseline, okay, uh, a little bit. Okay, so we'll do that on Wednesday. Um, yeah, that's it. Um, what can we expect of the final? Yeah, that's a... So I'm going to do um, open book, open notes, final, uh, you know, it'd be similar. I'm going to, I mean, we're short on time, right? So I'm going to probably get some, that's why I want to do a, an example question here. And I'll probably try and do another example question next time. And I'll give you some questions, example questions too. Okay. Uh, to get prepped for the exam, but it, it'll be kind of, you know, thinking about growth and competition and stuff like that. Okay. But I understand that it's a compressed time frame here now. Um, but the exam will be in, in, in structure similar to before. Uh, US was saying super helpful. Okay. So yeah, I'll do that. I'll give you, I'll give you sort of like what I, you know, example given the U S and we kind of, we, we know the U S and we can, you can use that. All right. So um, yeah, so the exam will be, will be you know, take home, whatever, uh, open book, open notes, uh, and um, I'll, I'll give you a little more time, okay? If you're, uh, if you are, I, I don't know where everyone is. If you if you're in a time zone that's like non-continental U.S., for instance, let me know. That that would be useful information because then I can try and adjust things for the exam. I don't want to have you taking the exam at two a.m. That's that's not that's not super good for performance, okay? So, but 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 yeah, the idea would be more open exam. As you guys had mentioned earlier, so we, we got there eventually, um, and uh, more probably more time as well. Just if you need it, you know, it's, it, there can be distractions at home and such. So uh, a little bit more time as well. Okay, but but in terms of the content, the structure, it should be fairly similar. It's just we're doing this this technology and endogenous growth stuff. Okay, so um, yeah, that's 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 the basic idea. Okay, and then. Uh, 
The exam. Uh, what is the exam? I always write that. I, I, I wrote that in the syllabus. I, I hope I did. Uh, exams. Yes. No, I didn't. Oh no, because it's it's dictated by externally. Okay, well, it's you know it's 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 in some giant PDF somewhere. I'll find it and then make sure that I tell you so that we're hundred percent in agreement and and we understand. But the basic structure is like I'll say, you know when that time is, um, I'll send out the PDF via email and we do it. It's just that it's you're doing it at home and it's open book and notes. Okay. Uh, I guess I'm kind of constrained in terms of timing because I don't want to overlap with other exams. It would also be helpful if you have another exam very soon after mine to let me know that too, to just to let me know where I am in that situation. Okay. Um, and then also finally, I'll probably do some kind of dry run where it's like, here is a PDF that is not an exam. Maybe it'll be like practice questions that I'm sending at a specific time. And like, so just, we, we have the, the, the basic workflow of like sending the exam down because it, it's, it's annoying and not good if, if that gets screwed up. Okay. So I'll do that as well. So we're like a hundred percent good on the exam. Okay. Um, all right. Let me know if you have any questions. I'll, I'll be in, in spaceship mode in the chat for, for a few more minutes here. Um, and otherwise I'll see you all on Wednesday. Okay. Thanks.